Hello there. Welcome to Refined Savage. Today on the show is John Meadows, IFBB Pro bodybuilder uh, and inventor of the Mountain Dog Training System. So check him out. This was a great interview. We talked a lot about nutrition and bodybuilding and supplementation and drugs and everything else that goes along with being jacked in 2019. Get ready for a good one. See ya. John Meadows, welcome to the show. All right. Well, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, we, uh, we had a little glitch uh, starting out here. Just, <laughs> my fault, uh, my fault. I was supposed to remind you that uh, I was coming down, but uh, we're starting at a, a, a pretty much regular time. We're on too late. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are here in Pickerington, Ohio, outside of Columbus. I, I was just talking, I was just had a podcast with uh, Dan Degg from Lex and Extreme, and I was telling him, I, I'm down here every month in Columbus because... I could run this podcast and do nothing but talk to people from the Columbus area. Mm -hmm. what, do, what do you think? What do you think that is? Why do you think everyone's down here? It's always been that way. I mean, <clears throat> I um, I started following bodybuilding very closely in the mid '80s, and um, I end up going to college uh, in Columbus. And that's what brought me to Columbus. And when I got to Columbus. There was a gym called, uh, it was, well, it was a world gym, it was out in East Livingston. And there were a ton of bodybuilders and powerlifters over there. It was very cool. And these guys were really good. And while I was over there, I met uh, some powerlifters who introduced me to Westside Barbell. So in the mid-90s, I started going to Westside Barbell. And, you know, as the years went by, I started thinking to myself, man, there are a lot of really good powerlifters around here. There's a lot of really good bodybuilders. And. You know, part of that, people say, is from the Arnold Classic. I think that probably started around 1988, kind of in that ballpark. I could be off by a year or two. I was, I was at the first one, so yeah, 88, it was 88. Something yep. like that. Remember, the the, uh, the expo was at um, Vest Memorial, mm -hmm. and it used to be a freak show back then. There, there wasn't um, kind of this uh, normal crowd uh, of, of, quote, normal people. Right. It was just a straight freak show. It was very entertaining. And uh, it's kind of always um, been that way around here in terms of a lot of gyms. I mean, like right here at my house, there are three awesome gyms within five minutes of here. I mean, just right here. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually five or six gyms within 10 minutes. And if you go around Columbus, you'll see that's pretty much true everywhere you are. I mean, in the suburbs, everywhere around Columbus, there are gyms and they all survive and they all do fine. And I, you know, and I know the gym business, you know, to a degree. And I've always thought, man, how do all these gyms stay in business? How are they all profitable with all the competition? But the people around here in this area just seem to uh, like to train. And, um, and then on a competitive level, there's so many people that have done well around here that uh, it's pretty amazing for, for this area. Yeah, it's not even like they're... Planet Fitness is there, you know, like I was just at Lexon, which is is a old school, hardcore powerlifting gym. And I remember those as a kid growing up in the Cleveland area, you know, you'd have oh, Black's, and gym, right? Black's Gym and yeah. Pump and Iron and, and all these Miller's Gym. And it, it was all these hole in the wall kind of um, hardcore bodybuilding gyms. And you, you just don't see those very much anymore, you know, especially, I mean, in the Cleveland area, they're almost gone. And uh, it, it's, it's kind of nice to come down here and, and see those gyms still thriving and doing well. Yeah, there are plenty of good gyms around here that um, there's no shortage of them. When people around here say they can't find a good gym, then I tell them, well, you're not actually looking. Yeah. So, yep, absolutely. How'd you get into the sport? How'd you get into bodybuilding in general? Well, I mean, just as a young kid in 1985, I watched the Mr. Olympia on ESPN. Um, and it was when Lee Haney won in Brussels, Belgium. And, um, you know, that I, I wanted to compete right when I saw that. I was like, that's it. I'm going to compete. I love this sport. It seems really cool. So I was reading all I could and it was muscle and fitness at the time. And I would always go to the kinesiology section and look at all the origins and insertions of the muscles and how they worked and all that good stuff. And I was just always really fascinated by bodybuilding. I really enjoyed it. Um, I didn't get into it because anybody picked on me or I was trying to pick up all the hot chicks. It wasn't anything like that. I just truly loved bodybuilding. And I suspect that's why I still like it so much because I think I liked it um, just 
for just out of the uh, pure love for the sport, and not because I was trying to impress anyone or do it for, do it for any other reason. Yeah, you're like I think the first person I've ever heard who who mentioned finding bodybuilding through Lee Haney's generation. We're normally our guys our age are oh, I want to look like Arnold. Everybody wanted to look like Arnold, you know. <laughs> and I'm sure he was an influence on you just <clears throat> like everybody else. But uh, that was an interesting generation of guys where you had Lee Haney and I, I was a big fan of Rich Gaspari and. Uh, Lee Labrada and those Gary Stridham. And... Sure, yeah. Well, Gaspari had just turned pro, and he got third place, actually, in that Olympia that I saw. Yeah, Haney won. Albert Beckles was second. Albert Gaspari Beckles, was third. Yeah. Fourth was Muhammad McCauley. Remember him, the Egyptian? Yeah. Fifth was uh, Mike Christian. Sixth was Barry DeMay. Seventh was Tom Platts. Wow. Eighth was Sergio Oliva. Ninth was Bob Paris. And Sergio tenth, Oliva tenth was Frank Richard. Another old school yeah, you, Is this just this Olympia that, that you was can recite that? The, or? the 1985 Olympia, what got me into bodybuilding, I'll never. I could go on with the yeah. rest of the placings, but I don't want to bore you guys. <laughs> um, but I really like that generation of bodybuilders. I love what Tom Platts brought to the sport. Um, I like little, that little Muhammad Macaulay dude. I thought he was pretty cool. And uh, Gaspari was certainly an inspiration because... He was only, I think, 21 years old at the time, or right around that age. He was young. He was mm -hmm. really, really young. And like I said, he had just won the Nationals. And then in 86, uh, I believe 86 is when your guy, Lee Labrada, I think that's when he won the Mr. Universe. He beat an Egyptian a guy named El Shahat Mabruk, mm -hmm. which competed. That guy, I mean, that guy probably was still competing in the universe when he was in his 50s. Wow. You know? And there was a guy named Phil Williams, that year that won the, uh, actually, I think Phil lost to a German, Joseph Gromlitz. I don't know if you remember him. Mm -mm, no. And then you remember Big Ralph Moeller, right? Yes. That was yeah. in, it's been in movies. Yeah. He was in the heavyweight class and competing against Ron Love, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah, there was another German, that. Peter Hensel, that won. Okay. A guy from Sweden, off Larson, got second. Ron Love got third. So, but Labrada won the middleweight class. And then Labrada went into the pros. I wasn't really that big of a fan of him initially. I yeah. always was like a Lee Haney fan, and Lee always called him Flea Labrada, right? Right. But then I went to the Arnold Classic, and I thought, ah, Lee, he's too small, and he looked amazing. Right. He just jumped out at you on stage, and I immediately became a fan of his. Yeah. Um, I actually just talked to Lee last year. Um, that guy has handled himself with classes. And you'll never hear anybody have anything bad to say about him. Yeah. Great guy, great family guy. I'm friends with his son who, who just won nationals. That's just a great family and great people. Successful businessman, too. He's got the. Well, look the, at the longevity of Labrada yeah. Nutrition. I mean, in the supplement industry, companies come and go. Yeah. And um, Lee's company is it's never, uh, I mean, I don't know all the inner workings of it, but it's been around a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So those guys have done very well for they were one of He was one of the first guys that I can remember who had a supplement company based on him. You know, he was the cover model. He was That's the right. owner, yeah. That's right. There was him and Gaspari, and uh, of course Gaspari had some challenges with his company. But you're right. He was one of the first guys who, he was the brand. Right, right. And he didn't, you know, he didn't need anything else. He was the brand. People trusted him, and, you know, with good reason. So I remember, I think it was the first Arnold when Gaspari and Tanya Knight won. Might have been the second one. I, I remember when Tanya couple. Knight won. I def you know what? You're right. Because they had the Sunday seminar. Yeah. And she spoke. And spoke. You're right. Yeah. Uh, and it brought the house down. I yeah. mean, when those two won, because it was just a bodybuilding show. Yeah. And uh, I remember being a kid. I was like, I remember I was like 12, 13 years old. And my father had driven me and my two buddies down and dropped us off. He went, hung out in Columbus, probably hit a bar or something and came back and got us. But I mean, this place was just it. The it, they were gonna tear that place down when those two won. They were yeah. so excited, and, yeah. Because uh, Gaspari was always like the the also ran guy to Haney. You know, Haney was Mr. second place. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was awesome. I remember that because I went to the seminar the next day. Right. And um, so certainly I remember Tanya Knight. I think she was with that Rick Valente guy. Back yeah. Then, maybe. But, uh, so what, didn't she do American Gladiators or something yeah, like that? Yeah, I believe I she did. Yeah, yeah. There was her, Ray Hollett. I think Ray, I think she wanted her name is Zap. Maybe. Yes. Yeah, I remember that. Um, she was super impressive. Super impressive, yeah. Back in the day. Yeah, because I remember a friend of mine, we were up in the balcony at the Arnold, and he he had to go to the bathroom. So we're, me and my buddy are up there, and all of a sudden uh, we see him walking over, and there's Tom Platts in a suit. 
and he goes up to Tom Platt's, and Tom Platt signs a, a dollar for me. My two buddy, you know, my other buddy are like flipping out that he's getting this autograph. Then we went to a McDonald's on the way home with my father, and he actually paid for the his meal with that dollar and lost it. Oh. So it's his pride, pride and joy, and he he gave it away for a quarter pounder. So you know, um, it's such a different world we live in today. Back then getting access to a pro was very, very difficult. They were, you know, you had them up on this almost godlike pedestal. I used to write letters in the Muscle and Fitness, um, say, hey, can you pass this along to Tom Plass? Can you pass this along to Rich Gaspar? Yeah. Of course, you know, they never did. But, um, you know, nowadays with social media, um, you have all these access to pros. And, you know, I, I answer probably 100 questions a day on my social media. It's unprecedented. But I kind of, that exclusivity and kind of that, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, that uh, that status was so cool those yeah, guys had. right. And I feel like some of the people today don't really appreciate the um, opportunity they have to interact with pros. I mean, a lot of pros would be, would participate more in forums and message boards, but you have all these people to get on there and insult them and yell right. at them. And, Whereas, where I think, man, what a crazy opportunity. I mean, if I was a young guy now, I mean, look at what I can do. I can send this guy a message, yep. that guy a message, yep. and some of them answer. And so it's just a different world now. Well, you know, just the way I do this podcast is the way I got a hold of you. I'll send you a DM if you want to do the podcast. Great, but I mean, when we, like you said, when you were kids, you could never have done something like that. You never would have been able to get a hold of them. You know, right? You see the. You know, the, the old ESPN used to have that uh, muscle show and you'd see these, you know, videos of these guys working out in these gyms. Who the hell knew where they were, you know? Everyone seemed to be in California. Uh, that was the Lose Wick show, yeah. Yeah. He had uh, the Muscle Mania show. Right, yeah, right. He had all those guys, yeah. It was, I was on one of those once. Were you? I was training the Perillos. Oh, yeah. Uh, in Cincinnati. Yeah. And there was me and there was a kid named Lamar Goodwin who was a supposed to be up-and-comer. And, -comer, and uh, I remember that, yeah. It was great. That was great. I used to wait for that, and you'd check your, you know, kids under, like, 35 are never going to run but you had, you know, like, the insert in your newspaper to find out when it was going to be on TV, and you, know, you yeah. highlight it. And... <laughs> yeah. So you got into bodybuilding, and uh, you ended up, uh, I think I read you you won, like, 18 contests over, over the last so many years. Yeah, I mean, I... I'm a little older now. I can't remember all the contests I've done, but the last time I tried to count, I think I've done over 60 shows. I think I won maybe 20 or so yeah. if I had to sit down and think about it and write them down. It's funny, you know, because I'll randomly just remember doing a show that I right. forgot about. I, I, for years, told everybody I never did the Junior Nationals. And then one day I was like, wait a minute. Yeah, I did. They had it in Cincinnati one year. <laughs> um Guy named Ken Brown won. Vinny Galani won the light heavyweight. You remember everyone else who won it, you know? Yeah, yeah. but I couldn't remember doing it myself. Right. I was like, wait a minute, I was actually in that show. I have a, that would be amazing that you well because you had gone through so many of them, but having to go through the kind of prep that you guys go through to do this stuff, you know, you think each one of them would be a nightmare scenario you'd remember. <laughs> well, I certainly remember the really really tough ones, and and I remember some early ones I did that I cheated on my diet and I messed up and things like that. I was fortunate because I had a really tough coach. Um, he um, worked up, I met him through Perlo. His name is Mike Matson, tremendous guy, still a tremendous friend of mine. And he, uh, he was really good. And he knew what I could look like when I paid my dues and did the things I was supposed to do. And I would show up to, to a show. I remember I, I competed in Columbus at a show called the Ohio Grand Prix, pretty prestigious show back then. Now, I remember I won my class, but I lost the overall to the middleweight by two points. And I remember I was like, okay, well, I still won. And uh, so I went out into the parking lot, uh, you know, with my uh, girlfriend at the time and my friends. And, you know, I was feeling pretty good about myself. I knew I could have been a lot better, uh, but I'd been cheating a ton on my diet. Mm -hmm. And um, so Mike walks out, Mike looks at me and he's like, you know, you might be happy with your result, but you and I both know that you could have won that show hands down and and you really let yourself down and i was like oh man yeah <laughs> he was right though right he was right he was totally right that was the last time i ever cheated on my diet right for a contest then you know i have scheduled like cheat meals but to just say i'm going to cheat on my diet never happened again because yeah. the i just remember thinking how bad that made me feel right and um 
so you know I think it's that was uh, that was interesting and those the, all the shows I've done through the years I've kind of been known for my conditioning and um, I attribute that to mental toughness. A lot of people think that getting in shape, they, they say, oh, it's not rocket science, it's easy. But those are the people who have never been under 4% body fat. Um, there is psychological warfare that happens when you get to around 4% body fat. And you will feel drained, you'll feel tired, your, your hormones are altered, you'll, you, just, you won't be yourself. Right. And there's a mental battle that goes on. It's almost like you go down to the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. So you remember Maslow's mm -hmm. hierarchy? The bottom yep. line was like food, shelter. Yep. Like you're on the food one. Yeah. All you think about is food. And you know people are like, oh, that's because your diets are so serious. You need to practice this type of diet. I'm like, no, you don't understand. When you're that lean, you don't wake up and feel great, feel great all day, then go to bed feeling great. It doesn't happen. So I always took a lot of pride in the fact that I could kind of win that psychological warfare game. And that's why when I went to shows, I always showed up in great condition. Yeah. And there's a, I can understand the, um, the game you play with the discipline too, where it, it becomes a matter of pride in yourself that I, I can withstand more than you can withstand. And it becomes a, if I'm going to cheat, you know, what is that going to do to me psychologically? I, I can totally get that. I think that's one of the things that people don't understand about when they see not just guys in really good shape in bodybuilding, but even the guys that come in 20th place. When, when some of these kid, younger kids see these guys on stage, this isn't how you look any, any time except for that time when you're on stage. You right. know, um, It becomes... I worry about people like we, we, we have uh, trainers in our area who work with these women figure models. And I think they, the, the plain Jane on the street sees these figure models who've gone through these incredible transformations. And they think they're going to look like that year round. Right. Yeah. And all they have to do is go to this guy and he'll just get them there. And they don't realize that these women have to go through this insane amount of torture just to get them to that place where they look okay for that one minute on stage. Yeah. They don't, they're not picking their kids up from soccer looking like that four right. months out. Right. No, that's absolutely, that's absolutely true. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, oh, I don't know if this is the right phrase but, or words, but there's a lot of mental issues that result from that obsession of looking that way all year round. I've seen, you know, there is a, this Columbus has actually got more bikini and figure pros than anywhere in the country. Um, they all, um, they, I don't want to say they all, but back in, back when the bikini and the figure, the visions, um, materialized, a lot of these women around here turned pro and they did great. And then two years later they would disappear and we would all always be like, well, what happened to so-and-so? What happened to so-and-so? And it was always the same story. Tortured herself, got in great shape. Did another show a month later, did another show a month later, did never want to lose that look. Oh, yeah. So they just pummeled their bodies into the ground, pummeled their metabolic rate into the ground. Then after a show, when they finally would stop competing, they had dieted for so long, so many months, sometimes a year straight. You know, just a normal amount of food for a normal person would cause extreme weight gain, you know, because they had suppressed their metabolic rate from low calories. And you eat... When you decrease calories, you decrease your metabolic rate. That's just that's just the way the body works. So they gain this weight back, and so they did starve themselves again. And this cycle happens, and then these these ladies mentally would just break down and say, "I'm I'm done." And I've seen that happen hundreds of times through the years with women. It's not it's not so much with men, but with women, it's a definite issue. Yeah, you you take it. My guess is that a lot of the women coming into that sport, and not all of them, of course, but a lot of them have some body image issues right off the bat to start with. And then you give them this tool where they see what they can do by dieting or, or whatever to get them into that state. It just makes it worse. You kind of compound those issues. Well, now think and think about social media, right? So somebody will get in shape and they'll take 100 pictures. So they'll post a picture every week. That's true. And then yeah. people think, well, they look like that year round. Right. I'm like, no, those are, you know, I do that myself. I take pictures of when I was dieted down, I'll post it. And people will be like, 
oh, is that what you look like? Yeah. Now? I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would be cool if I could look like that year round, but it's just not realistic. Um, and that happens too. You know, I, I know some of these social media personalities, they try so hard to stay in good shape year round, some of them. And then the other ones that are actually what I think ahead of the game, they just take tons of pictures when they're in shape. So then they can pose it whenever they want. <laughs> well, Dave and I talked about that, uh, Dave Tate and I, about these guys who have to kind of make a decision. Um, am I going to be an Instagram athlete and sell my online training program or my supplement line or my gear, but I have to hit a 900 pound deadlift every week in order to sell that. And then I'm out of the sport in five years. Right. Or do I train correctly and I go to someone like Dave Tate and I take a five year trip in order to be the best there ever was. And I don't know which way you go. Do you, do you go for that big money now in the short term or do you become some incredible power lifting athlete who maybe doesn't make any money, you know? That's a great question. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, honestly. I mean, I'm I'm obviously one of the guys that's stuck around. But, but hey, I mean, if I think I can do something that helps me sell programs and, and so forth, then, of course, I'm going to think about sure. it. I mean, that, that money is how I support my family. Right. Yeah, it's a tremendous, uh, tremendous dilemma that you have there. And uh, <laughs> I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I just think people just need to understand that, you can do this in the short term and beat your body into the ground. You'll make some money, but just be aware that you're going to probably never be the best or you're going to beat yourself to the ground. Right, yeah. And as long as you're aware of that, if you're cool with that, that's fine. Like, I know a lot of bodybuilders that said, once I get my pro card and compete, I'm going to retire. I just want the initials IFBB to put on my business card to enhance my business. I'm like, great. Go yeah, that's it. your that's your trip. Yeah. yeah, that's your trip. Go for it, man. That's great. Um you know, my goal was I just wanted to turn pro and do a show and always want to be an Arnold Classic. And, and then I turned pro and I placed in my first three shows right out of the gate. And I was like, wait a minute. Now I want to do more than the Arnold yeah, Classic. Yeah. Sometimes your goals change too. But yeah, I mean, everybody has a little different aspirations. And you know, the frustrating thing for me through the years was getting all those second place finishes and then a fourth or whatever, and then seeing those guys just disappear. And I was always like, man, I would have... You know, I would have yeah. competed as a pro. I wouldn't have just disappeared, but that's what they wanted. They just wanted to win their pro card and then go off into the sunset. So right. You can't knock them for that. Yeah, you see that in all sports. You know, I was a I was a professional Highland Games athlete, and you'd see these guys come on the circuit and, you know, win everything for three years. And then they just go, like, oh, I'm going to go and, you know, we're going to retire and go do this now. Now I'm into auto racing or whatever. And it's like, what, 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 how you could have been the best guy ever, you yeah. know? Right. It's crazy to see that sometimes. Um, so you work with clients now. Your wife was telling me that uh, you, uh, you're you going to go down and see the Tennessee Titans play. You've got a guy who plays for them. Do you get um, – I'm guessing you get a lot of bodybuilders and figure models. Do you get athletes too that, that need help with their nutrition? Well, the interesting thing is um, I really love working with athletes, but the large majority of the people I work with are – kind of physique athletes, they're bodybuilders or they're figure competitors or something like that. But I actually really enjoy working with athletes. I just don't work with a lot of them. But um, that's something I really like. It's a different style of training. It's very different than bodybuilding. And most people are very educated in working with uh, athletes or they're very educated in working with bodybuilders, but there's not many people that can do both. And... That's something that I like to do is work with athletes. I just think people see me doing, a, you know, they just associate me with bodybuilding. Sure. And then they see me doing some vertical jumps, and I have a 30-inch vertical leap, and it kind of blows their mind. Yeah. Like, How's that old guy with those legs doing that? It's because I know how to train athletes. Right. I know how to develop explosive force and things like that, which I really enjoy. So to answer your question, I don't do a lot of it, but I really do enjoy that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's a fun fun uh, part of the fitness uh, industry. I, Especially when you get uh, those high school, college age athletes who are just looking for some help because yeah. there's not a lot of it out there. Well, no, there. I mean, it's like um, you know, people always talk about strength coaches and how many of them aren't real good. And um, I get that. I get that. You know, you have all these high schools. You, you have all this need for all these coaches, but there's only so many people out there that are that educated. And you know, there's just there's just only so many, right? that are really, really good. 
So um, there is this void out there, I think, of for, for good coaching. And, um, you know, so, yeah, but, I mean, that's fun stuff. It really is fun stuff. Yeah. Um, we saw you up at uh, the Swiss conference uh, a couple weeks ago up in uh, uh, Toronto there. Mm-hmm. And uh, your presentation with Scott was fantastic. We uh, we weren't sure what, what that – conference was even going to be and I don't even think you guys do exactly what you were going to talk about before we went in there but uh, um, me and my friend Carrie were in the presentation and it it was very tailored towards the older athlete which right. we loved um, you want to talk a little bit about what you guys talked about and in, in, um, I know uh, you work with uh, Dr. Serrano a lot too mm-hmm. with, is it, and he's part of your team and yep. uh, his presentation was fantastic as well yeah, well, I that's the third time I've done the conference, and I talked about my training philosophies, and I talked about my nutritional philosophy. So I wanted to do something really different. So I was um, actually at the Mr. Olympia, and I ran into Ed Cohen, and I said, you know, I'll be at the Swiss. I'll see you there. I said, man, what do you think I should talk about? Like, I don't. What are what would what do people want to know? Because I don't really want to talk about that much about training and nutrition. I've already done that. And Ed said, you need to talk about how you're still training at a high level at your age. Right. Like you've been doing this a long time. You're 46 years old and you're still hitting it hard. That's what people want to know from you. Like, how are you doing this now? And then I asked Dave Tate actually, and Dave was like, you got to talk about how you stayed in the game so long because it's so rare. And those are two guys I obviously have a tremendous amount of respect for Dave and Ed. So, I said, you know what, I can do that because I have a lot of thoughts on how you stay in the game. So I called my friend Scotty and I said, hey, man, what do you think about this? And he's he's an older guy like myself and he's also, you know, he's a PhD. He's very, very educated. He's one of the top in the field. And he was like, yeah, yeah, that's great. He still trains hard. Super jacked. Super jacked. He still trains hard. He, he, He competes at a high level. And so we just said, yeah, let's do it, man. So I put my presentation together. He put his together. We looked at it to see if there was any overlap. And there was a little, but it wasn't bad. We both had some great, some ideas. And we, so we did it. And um, I'm super glad we did that topic. But I got to tell you, man, I was really nervous. I thought people would say, I, I, I really am not, I don't care about longevity. I just want the fastest road to being a champion. But the response I got, I had so many people say, that's the best presentation you've ever done. I was like, really? Yeah, it was, it was my favorite. Um, and, and I think there was a lot of young, there was a lot of young kids there, which I was kind of amazed about. But That's uh, because of my devotion on YouTube. <laughs> well, yeah, right. But, uh, you know, we really talked about it, how good. And, and there's so many different aspects, I think, into going into being, I'm 45, so... I've been training since I was 12, and I think there's so many different things that go into that from from, um, nutrition to proper training, especially as you get older, um, to the TRT. You know, I'm a big proponent of TRT. I tell people in my gym all the time, you know, I'm I'm 40 years old. I'm not making progress. I feel fat. I feel – go see your doctor, you know, and and, um, you guys talked a little bit about that. Dr. Serrano talks about that a lot. Um, I think it's a huge benefit that people our age should be using and aren't. And it's there's yeah. some stigma attached to it because that's it of right there. A- that's the athletics. Stigma. That's the stigma. Not... That's the problem right there. It's okay when a woman's hormone stops functioning for them to take hormone replacement. Right. But if a guy does it, oh, you're cheating. Oh, you're a bad guy. It's a very bad double standard and. And if you do the research, you'll see that low testosterone levels predispose you to many different things. You know, heart disease, heart attacks, all kinds of depression. Like, it's not a good idea to stand there and pound your chest and say, yeah, I'm natural. Yeah, okay, yeah, my testosterone levels are like a 12-year-old. Right. But I'm natural. Like, no, you're the guy that's going to die before me. <laughs> right. And, and, we're and, really... feel, and have a poor quality of life. You know, that's the thing. Like, having a poor quality of life, feeling bad, feeling sluggish and depressed all the time and having no strength like that's not a way to live life man no and there uh, you know there's you get sick all the time you, you know you're, you're exhausted all the time you're not you're spending all this time in the gym nothing is happening and you're not training for an olympic team you know there, there, there's no cheating here no one's yeah. you know you know i people 
I'm very open about it because number one, it's it's prescribed by my doctor and it's done safely, and I get my blood tested. And but it, it, you're also not doping like an East German shot putter. You're you're being brought up to levels that. And as far as the levels go, I think when you go to a, a a actual replacement treatment center, they're they want you to be at a different level than say your your doctor wants you to be mm-hmm. at your your personal doctor. And I, I yeah, I doctors just want to see you in range, right? But if you're at the bottom end of the range, you still don't feel very. That's well. not necessarily uh, a good path for you. Yeah, I, I like I said, anyone over. 35 or in that 35 to 40 range, I always suggest it. Just go get your levels checked, you yeah, know, look at it, hurt you. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, you got to get the blood testing done. And that stuff's super important. But um, when, you, when you have people that you're training and work with, are you having them go get blood tested and, and before we start doing the nutrition part of this? Or? I, I prefer that they get blood testing done. I, I, there's a lot of things I look for. If I had to narrow down some of the my things I really look for, uh, fasting, insulin level is very important to me. Not fasting blood sugar, fasting insulin levels. You can have a normal blood sugar level, but that could be because your pancreas is pumping out tons of insulin all day. But if, you're, if your body's really struggling, and even in a fasted state, it's still pumping out insulin, so your fasting insulin levels are high, there's problems. And... You know, these are people that are going to have a hard time with their body composition because they're they're insulin resistant. They don't really, we'll say, drive nutrients into their muscle as well as as, as they as they should. Um, and you know, you can influence the relative sensitivity of muscle cells just by training. Um, but even if you train and you're still you know, kind of skinny fat is one of the first things that I look for if somebody's skinny fat or they can't get a pump. So that one's very important to me. I like to look at HSCRP, uh, C-reactive protein for inflammation. It's a, it's an acute marker, but, you know, so it could be the result of an infection or you're sick or anything like that. But if you can kind of rule that out, you don't want people to be real inflamed. That's very controllable with diet and supplements. Um, that's very important to me. Um, I like to take a look at people's blood pressure. Of course, you don't need you don't need a blood work to do that. But in bodybuilding, there's a lot of people who don't watch their blood pressure and they get a lot of kidney damage done, and then they end up on dialysis. I mean, I've seen them happen many, many times. And what you see on social media is only a small part of the people who actually have that problem. Um, what else would I look at? I'd look at... Uh, cholesterol levels or anything Cholesterol like is a little tricky. It's not diet know? really related. Yeah, it's right? very tricky. Like yeah. you look at a lipid panel, total cholesterol is essentially meaningless. HDL, yeah, you want it to be high. They call that the good cholesterol, even though it's not really cholesterol. Um, you do want that to be high. Um, the, the thing that Dr. Serrano and I talk about a lot, because I used to be obsessed with cholesterol. I mean, I wrote articles on it. I was obsessed with it. I've studied... Some really smart people's work on it. Uwe Ravenskopf <clears throat> has uh, some great research on it that uh, some of the anti-fat people, um, you know, they kind of ignore that when they cite research. But anyway, so, you know, what Dr. Sharon and I look for is we try to keep triglycerides down and we try to try to keep HDL up. Triglycerides are something that you can influence pretty well with your diet and HDL also to a point. Um, LDL, we don't really look at a whole lot. LDL is tricky. You know, now they're in the particle size and, you know, if you have these fluffy particles, they call it, uh, they're, 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 you're not prone to them getting large and lodged into arterial tissue. Um, whereas the small particles tend to cause more, uh, more of that, uh, damage. You know, then you have the whole issue, well, what if it oxidizes? We know that the LDL can oxidize, and there's ways you can kind of fight that. But at the end of the day, a lot of it's genetic, and I think managing your HDL and your triglycerides are probably the keys. Total cholesterol, like I, in my opinion, total cholesterol is meaningless. Unless somebody's like 500 or 20. You know, if you're on an extreme like that, there's something really wacky going on. Mm-hmm. And it's probably some kind of disorder. It's probably nothing you're doing diet-wise. It's probably a genetic issue you have. 
But, you know, people have this magic number in their head. Oh, my cholesterol is over 200. That means nothing. That means nothing at all. In fact, if you do your research, uh, particularly for older women, you'll see the lower cholesterol levels. Actually, women have a higher mortality rate. Um, you don't want, you know, older women to have low cholesterol levels. Cholesterol itself is protective. It's an antioxidant. Um, so, yeah, the lipid panel is a little tricky. Um, I do like to look at kidney function. I like to look at EG, uh, EG uh, ejection growth fraction, creatinine, blood urea nitrogen, BUN. Those things can be influenced, obviously, by just having a large amount of muscle mass, you know, your, or if you're just simply taking creatine. Right. Your creatinine can be a little bit high, but you want your blood urea nitrogen certainly to be in range. Um, the EGFR is something that uh, you've got to really be careful with that. If that number starts going down 50, 40, 30, you've got some major problems. So you got to watch that, you know. We look at your liver. Um, that one's tricky too. AST and ALT are enzymes that naturally rise just from training. And being a little out of range is not a big deal. But, you know, somebody's, you know, bilirubin or, you know, some of those things get out of whack, uh, or, or if their eyeballs are yellow, you right. know, like Ben Johnson's was, yeah. um, you know you got a problem. So, um, but I really the fasting insulin one and the inflammation one are the, probably the two that I really like to take a take a look at. Yeah, gives you the the most bang for your buck as far as working with these folks. When you worked with, uh, we talked about uh, me going down to talk to Dave and what a good experience it was and how I kind of. Uh, I think you get one image of what Dave's going to be like from social media, and then you meet him in person, and he's he's just a, a fantastic human being. What was it like working with him? Because he, he, I'm guessing he's not the most. Uh, I'm guessing he's a fairly demanding person when you're <laughs> when you're coaching him. Um, I don't think so. No, I think he kind uh, of said he was. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. Let's see, I'm a little. I have a little different mentality than most people. Like I like. That kind of stuff, I appreciate that. Yeah. It doesn't bother yeah. me. Um, you know, Dave um, Dave is, has been an awesome friend to me, and he's been an awesome business mentor to me. Um, when I was kind of helping him get in shape, it wasn't me going to the gym and trying to push him. I went to the gym, and we trained together, and we pushed each other, and we pushed each other really hard. And I think Dave and I have a mutual respect for each other because I think we both understand we're good people, number one. Dave has this tough, hardcore image, but I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, he's a good person. He has a good heart. He has good motives, um, which is not all that common in this yeah. industry. So as a, as, a, as a good person, I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. Um, and what I really like about him is he's, he's honest and he appreciates honesty. So if I tell him, you know, you know, you, you need to really need to do this, um, I could be hard on him. The same thing is when I was trying to get my pro card, you know, he, um, he would say, man, this doesn't look right or that doesn't look right. And it never hurt my feelings because he was trying to help me. Sure. And uh, when you know someone's coming from a good place, you tend to be able to accept their criticism a lot better. You know that they're just looking out for you. Yeah. And that's how I always felt about Dave. Like he would always criticized me, but it was in a good way. It was in a way that was to make me better. And the same thing when I pushed him, when I wanted to, wanted him to go as hard as he could. It was, um, it was because I wanted to see him do well. And then there's another element of it where Dave and I have this common genetic trait where we just like to see how crazy we can go and how far we can push ourselves. And that's something that it's really hard to teach people. Dave has it before he ever met me. I had it before I ever met him. So you get two people together yeah. that just want to see how hard they can push. And we kind of fed off each other. If he went all out, then I didn't want to wimp out yeah. and vice versa, right? Yeah. And if I went first, I wanted to set the tone. I wanted to do something where I thought he's not going to be able to do this. Yeah. And he thought the same thing. So, but as a client, he was, you know, he wanted that respect. He wanted me to say, be honest with him, you know, or what am I doing? Am I doing, you know, the only challenge I ever had it with him was sometimes he, when he falls off the wagon with his diet, so he gets a little crazy. This is what we yeah. talked about. Yeah. That's the biggest challenge with yeah. Dave. It's not, there was no challenges in the gym or how hard he pushed himself or anything like that. It was sometimes when he just gets out of his groove diet wise, you know, I can get out of my groove and I can eat a meal or two. 
off and I can get right back on it. But sometimes when Dave would mess up, now you've got this snowball. He said it was like 30 pound jumps. Yeah, he yeah. said you tricked him into basically getting down to 220. So right, when he right. rebounded, he would go up to 250. <laughs> and he was like, that son of a bitch, you know, when he figured out what you did to him. But... Well, yeah, I mean, I did a little Jedi mind trick. I mean, yeah. he, when he got down to like 240, I would say, you're almost there. You'll yeah. probably be there next week. Yeah. And then the next week, I would say, man, you're so close. Give me two more weeks. And then two more weeks, he'd say, what do you think? I'd say, oh, you're almost yeah. there. Give me another week. <laughs> so we kept doing that. Yeah. <laughs> but that was, the, that was the way I felt that I could motivate him the best. I, he, he told that story on the podcast. And I thought it was hysterical. He's like, you know, he was telling me, oh, I think I can see a vein in your shoulder. And I mean, I've never had veins <laughs> in my shoulder. So I listened <laughs> to him. And I remember those old YouTube videos you guys training together were so inspirational. You know, Dave's dressed up like a Jedi or something yeah. with the hood on and all grainy old black and white footage, a lot of them. Yeah. Pretty impressive stuff. Yeah. Um, so now uh, you've got your, your program. How do, if, if someone is a, uh, uh, anyone who needs, whether you're a bikini or a bodybuilder or, a, or an athlete, how do they get a hold of you to, uh, get on the program, get some, get some coaching and get some nutrition stuff. And... Well, I mean, I'm very easy to find, uh, but my website is mountaindogdiet.com. And um, uh, my best, the best way to reach me is email. I never, ever miss an email. If I miss an email, it's because it went into my spam. But my, my email is mountaindog1 at live.com. Um, I would tell people to send me DMs on social media, but I get so many of them, I sometimes miss them. I frequently miss them. To be honest with you. I sent you both when yeah. oh, for yeah, our course part. I, I frequently miss them, um, and then sometimes I'll be going through them at breakfast, and I'm like, "Oh, I got this message three weeks ago," and I'll yeah. answer someone. And they'll be like, "Oh, thanks, man. I thought you thought you forgot about me." Yeah. Like, no, I just saw your message. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, good. And then you can find you on on uh, I know Instagram and and everything. So. Um, I want to thank you for having us down, and uh, this has been great. And I appreciate you being one of those guys who are accessible enough to say, "Yeah, come on down." There was never a hesitation, and we are actually sitting in John's house now, which I'm going to have security talk about him because I could have been a maniac. But, uh, <laughs> um, I really appreciate you having us down, and uh, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, my pleasure, man. All right, been John Meadows, the Refined Savage. See ya.